Konnichiwa. Welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast. Welcome to the first episode in the Jandals in Japan podcast. Well, Jane, here we are landing on our first episode of Jandals in Japan. I am so excited to be doing this with you. Yay, we made it. Otsukare. We've Otsukare, just, as, <laughs> as we they say, say here. We yeah. would say that. And, you know, we're in the middle here of Japan going through so many changes. Uh, we've got this coronavirus. And I think in Japan, the big thing that's happening right now is that businesses are looking to seeing if Japan actually does open up those borders. Uh, as we're recording this, uh, Japan has announced just very recently that it will be opening up the borders to students and also to business people coming into Japan. So, you know, the details of that, we look to see what they're going to be like, but they're releasing information on a daily basis right now. So things might change by the time this gets to everybody's ears. But at the moment, it looks like uh, Japan is going to be opening its doors for people coming here on short term business. And so we are looking forward to that. It's going to change things, isn't it, Jane? Phew, finally, we have some people allowed to come and see us here in Japan. It's been a while since that's been allowed to happen. And I see they're still capping at this point it with 5,000 entrants per day. So it could be a little while before we see some regular travel happening again. Things do take a, a little longer in Japan than you think they will. And to be aware that things could change again tomorrow. A new variant could be discovered and things could shut down. So always having your plan B's and C's in place when you're thinking about traveling at this time, I think is a very a good strategy to have. But here's fingers crossed that we're heading towards a more open uh, travel between Japan and other countries. We hope so. The devil is in the details. So those will Mm. be released and you can be guaranteed that there will be a lot of detail in anything that's released from Japan. They like to get things right by dotting I's and crossing T's. And the other thing is, I guess, that once people come in, you know, they're going to be able to do business here, but there, are there going to be restraints on staying, you know, in quarantine or mm, not? Movement, it seems like yeah. they're going to be released from certain countries. So there's a lot going on, but we do want people to be updated on this and we hope to give updates on further episodes of this podcast about what's going on in Japan. That's just one aspect of it right now as it today when we're recording mm. uh, and we look forward to giving you some more tips and updates from what's hot on the ground here as we get further into the mm. podcast series. Yeah, it's a great time to be planning your future trips to Japan for your business if that's what you are doing. And we have some great tips coming in our episode for how you can do that and with a lot of success from our first guest. We are thrilled to bring you Don Roxborough. He is well known in Japan, in the business community here, and is a member of the Australia New Zealand Chamber of Commerce and Japan Executive Council. Don is a founder and also a market entry strategist at Wholesome Japan. It's a company that imports a range of New Zealand organic and ethical brand name wellness products into Japan. Don's such an experienced hand of all things Japan with an incredible deep insight into how to be successful in this land of the rising sun. We are super pleased, Jane and I, to bring you firsthand the expertise and the wide experience of Don Roxborough. Well, kia ora and konnichiwa, Don. Kia ora. How are you doing, Catherine? I'm great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Don, it's great to meet you and have you on the show today. I can't believe you live actually not that far away from me, but we've never met. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, you can be. Uh, I actually met a Kiwi that lived 200 meters away from me for three years uh, in Tokyo. I met him yeah, just a couple of weeks ago. It's amazing how you can be so close in Japan, but uh, never bump into each other. So we have a surprise first question for you. All right. Don't get too worried. It's A or B. Karaoke or onsen? Which are you? Onsen. Onsen. Oh, have, man after my no heart. Singing voice. I have no singing voice. My son <laughs> and my wife uh, play the piano and they, they laugh at me all the time because when I try to sing a song, I'm always off tune, so out of tune. So uh, Even yeah. after a beer or two, your voice doesn't improve? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I'm onsen too. I think I these days I would choose onsen over karaoke as well. Onsen, for those listening who don't know, is a hot spring in Japan, the favorite pastime of the Japanese people. And once you've been here for a while, it's definitely something we all get to love. That's for sure. Certainly is mine as well. I remember when I first came to Japan, I didn't like karaoke and I didn't like onsen. No, me neither. Yeah. But I have grown to love onsen karaoke. Mm. The jury is still out on that one for me. Well, Don, so, so glad to have you here. The reason we invited you is because you've just been on the ground in Japan for so long. You have a wealth of experience here. I know you've been and come back and you went back to New Zealand for a little bit and came back to Japan, but you're a natural first guest for us for the Jandals in Japan podcast. So again, welcome. Thank you so much. It's uh yeah, Jandals. It's it's a pretty cool, a cool name for a podcast. And when I Thank when you. I heard that term, I'm like, oh wow, yeah, that sounds really <laughs> sounds me. <neat. laughs> Thank you so much. We'll be putting your full bio into the show notes. But Don, I really want to know. First up, your inspiration for coming to Japan. Why did you set up your business here? You could have chosen any country, right? But why Japan? Tell us a little bit about how you got going and little bits and pieces like that about yourself, please. Sure. If we go back to when I was a 17 year or 16 year old looking to leave New Zealand and try and put myself into a different culture and uh, environment with a different language. I don't really know much about the world. I was brought up in the in the in the north Northland, New Zealand, and uh, living in small towns. And uh, anywhere with a different language and culture was was kind of on the table. I applied for an AFS exchange program. Mm. Which you get to choose four top uh, priorities for countries you wanted to go to, and they had to be on in more than two regions. So I chose a couple of countries in Asia and a couple of countries in South America. And the interviewer for the AFS program asked me, Don, is there any reason why you haven't chosen Japan for one of those top four, four mm. countries? My reply was, oh, I haven't really thought about Japan that much. And Japan kind of comes across as uh, what I'd heard as a, as a kind of country bumpkin at the time was that Japan was one of these places with a high intensity of education. And I didn't feel confident in my ability to keep up in that environment and educational mm-hmm. environment and the pressure on school and things like that. As I was answering in that way, I thought, geez, Don, you're limiting your possibilities. Mm. And so I put Japan as one of those top four countries. And later on, I asked her, oh, what, why did you you know, what did you think when you asked me that question? She said, I thought you'd be a good fit, fit for Japan. And as you go through life, there's, you, you find there's pivotal moments uh, throughout mm-hmm. your life that really change the trajectory of, of where you end up. Her insight or her in- intuition um, had a, a profound effect on where I ended up. I came here as a high school student, spent a year wearing a, a very formal-looking Japanese high school unit. You know, I want to see a photo of that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, right. Yeah. And you, so you came to school. While I was here, I had a wonderful host family. I was in the uh, western part of Japan, on the um, Japan seaside side of Japan in a city called Komatsu. And I was the first exchange student for like 10 or 15 years there in oh, that wow. school. And uh, it was at a time when, when the, the stations in Japan wasn't really that English friendly. So you, you really needed to know Japanese to, to get around. And so you, back in those days, it was like everyone, look, kaijin da. And uh, <laughs> the little kids would be like this as, uh, as a foreigner as I walked past. But uh, times have changed a lot since then. And uh, with the tourists and tourism being so popular here now, it's, you, you don't experience that so much as you used to. But uh, back then, yeah, uh, being a, a, univers- a high school student here in Japan was, was relatively unique for a foreigner. After the exchange program finished, I went back to New Zealand and worked in tourism using my Japanese language for a couple of years down in Queenstown. While I was there, yeah, I kind of decided I wanted to advance my education, learn more Japanese. I only had uh, conversational level Japanese. I couldn't read it and write it at that stage. So going to university and learning, learning a deeper knowledge of the Japanese language 
um, seemed the way to go. And uh, another one of those pivotal moments was when a friend said, why don't you go to university in Japan? I was mm-hmm. like, geez, well, that, that makes sense. <laughs> 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 and uh, so I looked for a way to, to go to university in Japan. And when I reached out to the Japanese embassy in New Zealand, they said, oh, in a few months' time, there's ap- uh, applications going to close for a, a scholarship from the Japanese government, mm-hmm. which will give you one year Japanese language education and then four years to go to a Japanese university. I, I applied for it and was very fortunate to get it and spent four years at a Japanese university. And this little country bumpkin who didn't think he was able to keep up with the Japanese education system ended up going to Kyoto University, which is... Wow. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> one of the, the more prestigious universities in Japan. I, I think it was more luck than good management. I don't feel like I was fully qualified to go to Kyoto University, but uh, um, I did. That set me, up, set me up for a career here in Japan. And after finishing university, I went into uh, real estate finance. I got a job with uh, a company that was just starting to invest in and property that had really dropped in value after the, the Japanese the, the bubble uh, ended here in Japan. And uh, one thing led to another. I ended up being employed by large companies like General Electric, Cisco, uh, most recently Cisco Capital, which is part of the IT giant Cisco Communications. And I had an 18-year career in real estate and finance after I um, graduated from university. Within that, I, I went back to New Zealand for a couple of years and worked with the G Capital in New Zealand and, and Auckland for a wee while. Um, when I went back to New Zealand, I thought, I'm never going to be coming back to Japan. I'm going to be living in New Zealand for the rest of my life. And this is 2003, but one thing led to another. And uh, I found myself back in Japan in 2007. Life's been good back here. And 10 years later, I set up Wholesome Japan. What led me to set up Holes in Japan was after the GFC, the global financial financial crisis, a lot of change happened in Japan. Me and my team were made redundant there, and I thought, okay, this is uh, you know one of those times in life where where someone's telling you to do something else. I'd always had in my back of my mind that I wanted to do something between New Zealand and Japan, and also start my own business. And when I got made redundant, I thought, okay, this is a time to be free, and if I don't do it now. It, it's never going to happen. And I didn't have any business plan. I didn't have any products in my hands, but uh, I took what I, I knew well about Japan back to New Zealand and spoke to some, some New Zealand people about that. And that one thing led to another. I ended up importing food and skincare and other natural products from, uh, from New Zealand into Japan. And things have grown organically over that time. And my knowledge has grown. And it's, it's been a, a wonderful ride over the last uh, five and a half years. Wow, well, that was a long answer. <laughs> Five and a half years you've been working on your wholesome business. Wholesome Japan, mm. yeah. Wholesome Japan, I found it in 2016 uh, in November. And yeah, so it's, it's about five and a half years now. So how do you nurture and delight your customers in Japan with your New Zealand products? The first thing is to introduce them to it. And obviously it, it's got to be a product that is going to fill some need for them. So if it's a skincare product, it's, it's, it's a matter of cultivating them by being out there and explaining the background to the product. I import Aotea skincare from Great Barrier Island in New Zealand. And what I love about this product is it's got a, a New Zealand story. It's got a Maori story. It's got a real sense of location and soul to it, um, which... I love being able to tell that story to other people and being able to tell that story is, is the, sows the seeds of that yeah, delight and nurture, nurturing of those customers. Uh, and then obviously you've got to be able to follow up with that and um, deliver on time and communicate well with them. But um, yeah, that's kind of how I go about it. And how are you doing that now that, you know, we're at distance, there's a a pandemic going on? Have you still been able to do all that delivery? I expect that you can tell the story uh, online and those sorts of ways, but you're not actually meeting with customers, I'm expecting. But tell us a bit more about that, how you keep that up and don't use a, a pandemic as an excuse not to continue the nurturing. For the first 
the first six to eight months of the pandemic, it was it was really challenging because at the time it was a coronavirus was a scary thing. Now I feel that people have are not as scared scared of it as as we were before. I certainly aren't. Uh, I've gone back to living normally. I think there is uh, ever increasing distance between, in some ways, almost like what I'm doing is on the on the front line, on the customer facing front line in some aspects. So in some ways, see myself similar to the shop assistants. So to do what I do, I still go out. So even during the pandemic, in the first year of the pandemic, initially, some of the food shows, the exchange, uh, the expos and those sorts of things were closed down. But later on in the year, once things return to normal, um, they open up again and we are proactive in getting out there. Those food shows, they're a necessary part of the infrastructure for cultivating innovation, cultivating new customers. And I'm a firm believer that even in the, in the pandemic times, true face-to-face in-person in communication has, still has its place. And I still go out and, and this week I'm going to be going to a, one of my customers' stores to talk to customers about the Aotea skincare and give them tastings of manuka honey and those sorts of things. Personally, I'm a big believer that, in continuing and making sure that life is going on. And people that are doing that, particularly the trade shows and that sort of thing, you don't have the bigger corporate customers there, but people that are going to the trade shows are going there for a purpose and you do get, still get good leads there. And likewise, this last weekend in, here in Scuba, I was at a farmer's market. And I think being here in Japan, my role in being the person to have those conversations with customers is even more valuable now than what it was two years ago when a New Zealand person could possibly come and have those conversations in person as well. So really making the most of your opportunities is really great, Don. Well done. Keeping up your activities despite the challenges that have you've had mm-hmm. thrown at you over these last two years. So I'd love to know, is there something about being a Kiwi that is the X factor driving your success here? Or what does it take to be a successful Kiwi doing business in Japan? What sets us apart from other foreigners working <laughs> here? For me, um, I'm lucky I'm, uh, I'm short <laughs> in stature, so <laughs> I blend in easy. So you need I to mean, be I short, to, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they put that on the list, short. <laughs> uh, I wish I could say the, say the same about going, uh, you know, being a bit bald on top, but uh, <laughs> it's a little bit easier than some other nationalities for us to generate empathy with the Japanese people just because we're – a little bit more, this is a stereotype, and I know, but yeah, other countries tend to be a little bit more direct and mm. the communication is, is a little bit louder. New Zealand, we're a little more restrained. And also some people may think of it as a, as a, a negative, but I think the fact that New Zealand is, is a, a very flat society you know it's you can easily knock on the door of a C- ceo's office in new zealand and and speak to someone you don't have to you have the bureaucracy like you have in some other countries and here in japan where that is the norm not being afraid to go and knock on somebody's door or meet uh, with someone i think is a little bit of an advantage that we have from our upbringing uh, as a new zealanders and don i'd say that you know japan is really a country where you just can't come in and leave you have to really be here for the long term i think you've given that through the story you've told with your touch points over such a long time you know in some markets perhaps people do jump in and then jump out trying to make a buck shall we say but being in Japan here is something you do for the long haul. So if you were going to be writing a handbook or a playbook, for example, coming into Japan, and I know you're a, a strategic market uh, analyst and a uh, person who always is helping people come into Japan as well, what would you put in that book? What would be your top few tips that you would want to have in there for people who are coming into Japan, especially if they're Kiwis? That first chapter is... is, is depending on what we're talking about, could be a five-page chapter or it could be a 500-page chapter. 
um, <laughs> for the purpose of this, this podcast, I'm just going to speak about three quick points. The first one I would advise is definitely coming to Japan yourself, spending time here, looking at similar products in the Japan market, understanding where they're placed, and just getting a feel for yourself about where your product actually fits in, in the Japanese landscape. The second key point is, as you just mentioned, Catherine, expect things to take time and also longer than you initially expect. If you are lucky and get some really good instant success, that is the exception rather than the norm. And often brands that have had that instant success have not necessarily been here for the long term for a number of of reasons. Maybe they had the wrong partner. Maybe they're in the wrong store. Maybe their product wasn't quite right for the Japan market. And the third one is take time to find the right partner and base your decision on your cultural fit with that partner and support them any way you can to tell your full story. And not just about you know a few quick attributes of, of your product, but why this, this product is fabulous and why it de deserves to be in here in Japan and what you truly feel your product will do to serve the Japanese consumer. You need to invest that time on your end to create that story. That's fantastic. I, I love that point about the story. And you mentioned it before about the Aotea, how they have a fantastic story. Just weaving that story around your product really makes it stand out because if you've never been to Japan, you may not know there is everything in this country. You can find almost absolutely every kind of product you would want, whether it be something from France or from Spain or wherever. They're selling it in Tokyo, right? So why would someone find your product out of a whole bunch of products, right? And why would they choose your skincare or your honey or <laughs> whatever yeah. your product is, right? And it's a story that's going to sell them and keep them using that product right so true. yeah it's it's very easy for for new zealanders to kind of expect you know uh, it's from new zealand it's got it's got new zealand's brand uh, it's got the new zealand image and brand behind it but that only works to a certain extent and also depends on your product for example olive oil there are, are new zealand olive oils here in japan but if you're a japanese person Olive oil, that's an Italian product. Yeah. That's the mindset you're coming from. Yeah. Without bringing your, the real aspects of your story and, and what makes you unique to, to the market, then that's not going to you know, be a different, just New Zealand's not going to be a differentiator. And it's going to take you longer uh, if you don't have that prepared and, and ready to go. So what would you say, I mean, you've given us some three great tips. What would you say would be a pitfall that... People need to be careful about coming into the Japan market where they can get tripped up easily. <laughs> the biggest pitfall I, I think a New Zealand company might be susceptible to is just sending a product, sending a, bits, a few bits of information and expecting your partner here in Japan to do the rest for you. And that's not a, re a recipe for success here. You, you need to support your partner. And you need to make sure that your partner is, is really the right one to be telling your story as well and support them in those efforts where you can. I think that's right. I mean, that's the whole meaning of partner, isn't it? That doesn't mean that somebody does everything for you. Thanks very much. You're in Japan. You do it all for me. It is really a partnership, a joint activity. I love that you've touched on that point. I think too, Don, we've heard some real negative comments about Japan and I just want to go there for that topic because people will say Japan is you know only speaks Japanese it's so hard it's so complicated it's too hard to go and do business there I, I want to say that that's kind of a myth in my book you've been here a long time I've been here 20 years Jane 20 years as well we know it's not that hard how about for you tell us about some of those myths is it really that hard in Japan or is it somehow not as hard as, as everybody thinks? It can be hard if you're expecting urgent, uh, immediate success. It can be hard if you're underprepared. Uh, in my key product categories, uh, for example, as a food exporter, if you're underprepared means not knowing your ingredients, not knowing what additives might be in them, 
not having those in good formatted lists, not having done the key basics right on the New Zealand side. And just because New Zealand doesn't have the same regulations as Japan doesn't mean that you shouldn't know those details that the Japan government's going to ask you for as you bring your products in. Personally, I'm grateful that that myth is still out there. Uh, it means that the products that do take the step to come here have a bigger chance of su success. And when people have heard that myth, I would invite them to just think back to what I mentioned earlier in the podcast about me being this little country bunk and worried about whether I was going to be able to survive a year in a Japanese high school. <laughs> that Japanese high school uh, experience led me to totally different things in life. Mm -hmm. And Japan is one of those markets where I firmly believe that can be possible because that attention to detail and knowing your stuff is a good discipline to have if you're an exporter, no matter which country you're from. And learning that hands-on as you're working with hopefully a, a good, solid, dependable company partner here in Japan, it's going to help you in ways that you can't imagine. It's going to help you way in ways that uh, a partner in Australia who has a much simpler job of importing a product is not going to be able to do. So I really encourage you to make that effort. And the earlier you can make that effort, the better organized you are for global success in other markets as well. There you go. Mm, that's mm. it. That's it right there. How do people go about finding that wonderful partner, their first customer? How do they do that? Well, as I mentioned, coming here to Japan yourself and looking around is one of the key things. NZTE is a, a very good resource. We've also got the ANZCCJ here in Japan, which are another potential resource. If you personally have any other connections to Japan, whether it's through customers and other markets, I've heard of people being invited to, to try and bring their products to Japan through their connection with uh, distributors or companies in Hong Kong or Singapore or other places. So reaching out to your network is the best place to start. In most cases, you'd be quite surprised what you have in your, what resources you have in your network. And also, you know, reaching out to, to others in the market as well and not being afraid to reach out to people doing what you're doing in, in the Japan market and saying, I've got this, uh, got this product. I'd like to bring it to Japan. If you don't mind, would you mind spending 30 minutes of your time just to, to give me your thoughts and uh, share a little bit of advice with me? That's kind of how I would go about it if I was on the New Zealand side. Awesome. So now it's time to dust off your crystal ball. And let us know, what do you think might be coming up in Japan? Are you seeing any trends or people who are just thinking about coming over from New Zealand who are planning now to come to Japan, something that you are noticing that they might be able to take advantage of in the near future? Attending multiple trade shows here in Japan over the last 24 months, I've seen an uh, increasing number of companies uh, exhibiting vegan products, also alternatives to dairy and um, other products like that uh, are slowly uh, increasing in their visibility in the Japan market. And also SDGs, sustainability, those, those key global initiatives have hit Japan. Japan is trying to catch up with the, where a lot of other countries are in that space. And there are lots of opportunities here for companies that can, can really talk about how their products are better for the environment. I'd encourage exporters from New Zealand in that space to, uh, to really consider Japan as a, a country that is open for business in those particular fields. Of course, it's the same across all other product ca categories with the, the last two years of limited air travel companies haven't been able to come to Japan the way they wanted to. So opportunities are here if you, if you can get here and if you're prepared to take the time to, to work here in the, in the Japan market. Super. Wow. Were any activities or promotions that you yourself, Don, are promoting or getting into right at the moment that you can share with us that people might be very much interested in? Yeah, thanks for that uh, invitation, uh, Catherine. And uh, I really appreciate the, the love and support you've shown, particularly the our tear products over the last few years since we've been here in Japan. We do have a, a coupon code on, on my website. The website's 
online store is wholesome japan one word dot jp and um, it's going to be in the in the show notes I'm, I'm guessing and if you use the the coupon code jandal j-a-n-d-a-l we will um have a nice uh surprise discount for you at uh, upon checkout Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Get on there and start ordering your New Zealand goodies so that you can enjoy here in Japan. It's awesome. Thank so, you. Don, any last words before we wrap up today? Something that we may have not gone over with you or that you really wanted to have uh, out there for everybody to hear? Well, since your podcast is talking about jandals, I thought I wanted to um, bring another shoe that has meaning for me here in Japan. <laughs> we're on zoom right now and don is holding up what looks like a trainer but well used one tell us about it it's a trail running shoe <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why i wanted to talk about this because it summarizes a few things that we've talked about spoken about in the podcast first of all i started trail running seriously here in japan as a high school student so i i started my trail running here in japan uh, as a teenager. So I wanted to bring that to the conversation. And also to be successful in Japan, I think a trail running shoe is, shows some of the properties of it. You, you need to have good grip. You mm-hmm. need to be hardy. You need to be something that's good for, for the long distance, for a long run, and don't necessarily need to be pretty. <laughs> you just need to be designed for the right purpose and something that people are going to love to use. There you go. That's awesome. Love it. The analogy of the trail running shoe. (laughs) (laughs) I thought you might be going to bring out like a a getter or or something like that. You know, we're talking about jandals, but no, the trail running shoe is the shoe you want to be wearing for this long distance, (laughs) long term relationship. So amazing. I love that. And we need to take a photograph with you with that shoe because (laughs) that's really symbolic. I really (laughs) want to say thanks so much, Don, and congratulations on being such a successful full jandal in japan and thank you for telling us your story today your journey your tips for success some of those pitfalls and we've really enjoyed speaking with you and i hope everyone's going to take on your advice and be a very successful jandal in japan as well thank you thank you so much catherine thank you jane thank you So, Catherine, that was a really great first interview with Don from Wholesome Japan. He's such a lovely guy. It's so great to have him as a member of our Kiwis in Japan community, don't you think? I do. He's not only a wholesome company owner, he's also very wholesome himself. You can tell from his amazing story from his early roots in Japan and his dedication uh, to the language and culture and how that's been instrumental in his success here. Definitely. Yeah. So tell us your top three things that you took away from the episode today. Mm, It's hard to pull out three, but I really did like the idea of the story. Yeah. I think Don really hit that well, that not only the New Zealand brand, right, relying on that carrying you through is not enough, but having the story behind it, why this product is so important. Where did it come from? Uh, who are the people making it? Tell us that story. That's really going to sing to the hearts of Japanese people. As he said, the soul and location. I thought that mm. was absolutely wonderful. I also really loved Don's three points that he pulled out. And, you know, we talked about uh, spending a lot of time in Japan and being here for the long run. But I really thought that his comment about expecting things to take longer than they will Mm. is so true i think we can be quite panicky and want things done so fast but in japan things do take longer some things are quick but most things take a little bit longer and longer than you expect so you've got to be giving more time to japan in order for them to get to the yes or get to the answer or reply to you those sorts of things so just to be wary of those and i think the third one would be choosing the right partner Don spoke about that a couple of times there. And uh, it's obviously very important for his success to have chosen the right people, not the shiny object that came along first, the ones waving the big money. Um, He's invested in people who have been here for the long haul. 
and he's chosen on trust and respect and on shared values and shared culture. Mm. And I think that was an extremely good point that he pulled out. And obviously he's got that all documented with paperwork, uh, contracts and things like that. But that's what sustained him as a great business owner here, um, successful Jandal in Japan. So those would be my three. Mm. I was very interested to hear that he picked up on the increase in interest in vegan products and products that are environmentally friendly is really taking off here in Japan. I've definitely noticed that in my own daily life shopping in the supermarket. I noticed, wow, finally we have a variety of nut milks in Japan. (laughs) The nut milks have arrived to the supermarket in Japan. So I feel like, yeah, we can now find coconut yogurt and things that just have not existed here until very recently. So that is a huge chance for New Zealand businesses going forward. If you make the mistake of thinking Japan already has all these things, well, actually, it's just a a brand new area of consumption in in this country, I feel. I agree. I think there's a surreal turn from... Um, what was probably considered as an outlier, vegetarianism, to now moving through those areas, as you say, veganism. I mean, now I think people in Japan are understanding the difference and looking for those products. they didn't know the difference. Yeah, looking for those products. Mm. Um, So I'm so excited to see what's happening in Japan in that way, and I think that is an absolute goldmine waiting for New Zealand companies to come in and and have an adventure with in Japan because I think it's completely doable. Awesome. Alrighty, and Don was very generous to provide a code for our listeners. So make sure you use that. If you're in Japan, you can purchase his wonderful New Zealand products. He's got peanut butter, picks peanut butter, and what else has he got? Uh, Altia products. Uh, Altia skincare. Skincare. He's got Manuka honey as well coming from Altia and another brand I know he's also put through as well. And he's, he's got, got his food, his health crackers, bars. Crackers, crackers his health and bars. bars. And his crackers. Very yummy, yes, yummy, yummy things break. on there. All great stuff. So, yeah, the Jandal discount code, please use that and take <laughs> advantage of it. And uh, let him know that you heard him here on Jandals in Japan. Tell him what you thought. It's great to support and also give feedback to people when they have done a good job like he has. So we're really happy to have had Don on first. He was just superb. Thank you so much, Don. Yeah, thanks, Don. Awesome job. Well, that's all for this episode of Jandals in Japan. We'll see you again very soon. We have some really great guests coming up, don't we, Catherine? We do. Keep keep this on your Make radar. sure you subscribe. You're, are you subscribe. Sub- yeah, subscribe so you get it automatically delivered to your favorite listening device. <laughs> yeah, we already have some great people coming up, so please do do that. And we'll see you soon. See you soon. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Matane. Matane. for listening make sure you check out our guests links in the show notes this podcast is brought to you today by Catherine o'connell law and pod launch with jane if you have a great story you think should be on the show come and find us on linkedin or instagram we'd love to hear from you see you next time matane